Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly show. Today's guest is an atheist and liberal redneck, comedian Trey Crowder. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Can you be a liberal redneck? Today's guest is living proof. And before we bring on comedian Trey Crowder, I would like to first introduce my substitute co-host, FFRF's director of First Impressions, Matt Canyon. Thank you for joining me today. I'm a big Trey Crowder fan, so happy to do it. So take it away. All right. Comedian Trey Crowder is co-author of the books Liberal Redneck Manifesto, Dragging Dixie Out of the Dark, and Round Here and Over Yonder, a front porch travel guide by two progressive hillbillies, to which is added, yes, that's a thing. He received the Freedom From Religion Foundation's Emperor Has No Clothes Award as an outspoken atheist back in 2016. You've seen him on Nightline, Real Time with Bill Maher, The View, Netflix, and On the Road. And even once before on Free Thought Matters. And we can all use a good laugh around here, so we're so glad to welcome you back to Free Thought Matters, Trey. Hey. So, so Trey, how did you become a liberal redneck atheist? Uh, I mean, what I've always chalked it up to was uh, I was raised by a single father, primarily a uh, whole opioid crisis did a number on my mama, as it did a lot of people. But uh, my dad raised me and my sister. My dad only had one sibling, my Uncle Tim, and my Uncle Tim is gay and, you know, openly gay and, you know, had been openly gay since before I was born, since the 80s, whatever. So my dad... Uh, I think for that reason, although he never talked about it openly, my dad didn't go to church because, you know, they do a whole lot of stuff that don't really jive with loving your gay brother in like Southern Baptist churches and things like that. So he, he all I know is my dad didn't go to church. He didn't make us go to church. I wasn't raised in church. So I kind of grew up just a religious, which is odd for uh, middle of nowhere, Tennessee. But I always figured that was the the main reason why. And then I started when I got older and started having thoughts and opinions of my own. I just knew that. I, you know, loved my Uncle Tim, and I wasn't down with all the homophobic stuff that I heard happening a lot, and that was kind of my entree into being, uh, for that region, a contrarian politically and ideologically, I guess. And then it just every every new thing I became aware of, every new, like, political stance or argument, I just found myself falling on the left of it, basically. So there you have it. Well, it's kind of a humanist journey. So, Trey, we have a short clip from your Netflix special, Damn Boy, where you tell the story about how you first met your wife, another atheist in the South. Because we met working at a bar together in Cookville, Tennessee, just up the road here. Yeah, a absolutely. Noted stronghold of enlightenment, Cookville, Tennessee. <laughs> and one day early on, I overheard her talking to another server about that girl's roommate who wrecked her car. And the girl was totally fine, but it f***ed her car up. She got a DUI situation and the other server was saying yes yeah, just it's terrible you know and I'm gonna I'm gonna pray for her and my future wife without missing a beat goes that's crazy I too am gonna do nothing at all to actually help <laughs> oh my god have my devil babies you godless snowflake so that's when you knew you met your non-soulmate, I gather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that was definitely a big part of it, I assume, for her, too. But definitely for me, I had never even really thought about it until I met her and we started dating. But, like, 
it made me realize in retrospect that every other girlfriend I'd had up until that point, and I was like 23, I think, when we met up until that point, had been like a, you know, more typical, like conservative Christian, you know, tried to make me go to church, would get mad at me for not wanting to go to church or not being down with the Bible, that type of thing. One of my long-term girlfriends was from like a old school Catholic family, like don't believe in birth control type Catholic, you know? So, I mean, that's what I, but I just never really thought anything about it because it's just where I grew up and that's just how it was. But then when I met my wife and realized that she wasn't like that and it was the first time that ever happened to me, it was kind of a mind blowing moment for, for sure. How do your Southern families, both yours and your wife's, uh, react to your liberalism and atheism? My dad, you know, he was a religious too. He always used to say he didn't like openly call himself an atheist. He just used to say he, you know, he called all organized religion BS and said he, you know, all, no, nobody knew any more than he did. And all, it was all a great mystery. And that was the only answer there was in that type of thing. So that was his philosophy on that. So he never minded the religion part at all. And he was also like, he was a lifelong Democrat and he hated George Bush and everything. So I never really had a problem with it. I mean, I was, and like I said, my mom's side of the family, I'm not super close to so people, more stereotypical type conservative Christians in my mom's side of the extended family. But because of the whole situation there, I just don't have a lot of contact with them. Also, I should mention my dad passed away of pancreatic cancer like 10 years ago, but I was sort of, I'm just sort of the way I was raised to be. My wife is the more classic, like blue sheep. That's what I call it. Most, <laughs> most of the Southern liberals that I know are, are like the blue sheep in their family. Uh, and my wife is, she's that, but like her family's cool. They're, uh, they're not uh, they're not overly fervent or hardcore. They're not, uh, you know, mean or judgmental about it. They I mean, also, they're like, frankly, they probably wouldn't like me saying this, but it's the truth. They're that type of like they self-identify as Christian and everything. But like, I don't ever remember them going to church. Not once, not even on Christmas, you know, and that and there's a lot of families like that in the South, too. So I sometimes I kind of think secretly they're not super into the whole, you know, Southern Baptist scene either, but they just can't say that out loud because where they live. But that's just my theory. I'm just speculating. They have not confirmed that. But yeah, it's we're lucky. It's not so bad for us. So, so Southern Baptists do dominate in the South, though. So I think you have to really be committed in order to make uh, being a liberal retinue your comedy shtick. So where does that commitment come from, Trey? I think back on myself in like high school and stuff, and I can't believe I had as many friends as I remember having because I feel like I was kind of insufferable because I used to like I was like the smart kid in my class. But, you know, I'm from Clay County, Tennessee. My class had 60 something kids in it, and that's the biggest class that school systems ever produced. It's normally like 30 or 40 kids. It's a town of, you know, a thousand. There's no traffic lights. So the bar is <laughs> pretty low. It's not that impressive to be the smartest kid in a class in Clay County. But uh you know, it's not like being at Princeton or something, but I didn't know any of that. I had no frame of reference. And so like, I was the smart kid in my class and I always made really good grades and stuff. And so like, at like when I was 18 and left Clay County, I genuinely thought I was goodwill hunting. Like I thought I was like a literal <laughs> prodigy, like genius level intellect. Like that's what I thought about myself. And then I had a massive quarter life crisis having to reconcile with the fact that that was not true once I got out into the real world and everything, but I'm fine now, largely. <laughs> anyway, point is because I thought I was so much more supremely intelligent than everybody else that I was in school with, the fact that I had different opinions on things than them never seemed weird or off to me. It didn't bother me. And I was never like ashamed of sharing them. Like when things would come up and they would think this, but I would think something else. I'd be like, well, that makes sense because they're stupid and I'm smart. So like, <laughs> you know, it's not weird that I think something different than they think. And also like I was so confident in how much smarter I was than them that I never held back or whatever. And so I was always kind of, but I was also kind of, kind of goofy and funny too. So that, that's, that's how I think it was more palatable to people. And I, you know, they didn't just outright hate me for that. Cause that's not, you shouldn't be that way. But like that made me very contrarian, I think. And, 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 and also very like steadfast in my contrarianism, which just carried over into, I mean, the rest of my life, I've just never really been, uh, I've never shied away from, you know, sharing my, uh, differing opinions uh with the other people in the south and and you know and then when i started stand up same thing i want and doing stand up i wanted to be the kind of stand up that like pushed 
boundaries and push the envelope and stuff. So that was never a problem either. Didn't always go great, but you know, it probably went better than most people would expect, I think. So almost as if comedy was a defense for you. Oh yeah, I mean, for sure. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that was more about, it. comedy was definitely a defense mechanism for me, but I think that was less about my like, you know, nascent political or religious ideology or anything and more about uh, just the childhood trauma that I underwent. You know, it's like, it's kind of a cliche in the comedy world. Not all of them, but so many stand-up comedians, you start talking to them about their background and stuff and it's just rife with <laughs> bleakness and trauma and despair and stuff like that. And so that's kind of, like I said, you know, my mom wasn't, my mom was a drug addict who also sold drugs and went to jail multiple times. It was just never really around. My dad was got sick when I was in high school and then was sick from that point on. The town I was at living in got ravaged by both the opioid crisis and uh, economically after NAFTA, the factory left town. Poverty levels of, you know, economic devastation for 20 plus years. So, I mean, it was all pretty rough, and uh, I, that's what I've always chalked the, like, comedy part up to. You know, the cliche is you laugh to keep from crying type of mm -hmm. thing. That's what I've heard a lot of other comics say, but, I mean, yeah. Ma who knows? Maybe it's just in my blood. I don't know, but that's what I've always thought. Sure. So, speaking of politics, here's a bit of what you've said about the January 6th insurrection. I think that'd be a valuable lesson for kids to learn how to differentiate between clearly made-up bull an actual reality, you know what I mean? Especially in the world we live in. Like, if we'd focused on that 40 or 50 years ago, then maybe January 6th wouldn't have happened, you know? I, I, they, oh, my God. January 6th, a day so dumb, if somebody had explained it to you before it happened, you would have been like, stuff can't be that dumb. <laughs> and then stuff was like, watch me, a man got trampled to death wearing a don't tread on me shirt. I... <laughs> so, so I never thought I'd laugh about January 6th. Is there <laughs> anything funny about the possibility that we are facing the demise of our democracy in the United States? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, no, it's definitely not funny. I, I mean, I'm super worried about it, uh, too, for sure. I mean, I have two children uh, and everything, so I mean, I do worry about it. But again, it's just kind of in my nature, like I'm going to keep making fun of it, although just because I'm a I mean, that's what that's like my job now. But also that's just how I process things and what I do. I think that there's always because and this is it, this makes it even scarier and more unfortunate. But because the nature of our particular demise in this democracy is so stupid and like like comically over the top dumb, like the people at the people perpetrating it or like these laughable characters and everything that it's almost hard to believe that they are even in the positions they are in. Like it, that makes it inherently easier to make fun of and find things that you can laugh at. But again, it's a laugh at it to keep from completely breaking down into an existential crisis type <laughs> of situation. Cause it is very scary, but I think you could try to make fun of anything, you know? So we <clears throat> want to show another clip. This is from your weekly rant series this time talking about the satanic temple and Christmas. I wanted to make a Christmas video because it's only five days away. Tis the season, y'all. I just want to put this little missive out here and, and ask y'all this Christmas season, don't forget to set aside some time and praise the dark Lord Satan in his unholy name. That's right, feel the malignant spirit, baby. That's right, the most fetid of blessings indeed. Nah, I'm just kidding, Satan ain't real, obviously. But that doesn't stop him from having quite the moment in the sun this Christmas season. Satan's been everywhere. He has, there's a Satan statue in the Iowa State House, all these after-school Satan clubs popping up around the country, all of which has been threatening to collapse the global pearl economy on account of all the clutching that Christians are doing over it, which is how you know it's working, baby. And none of it's actually about Satan. It's the Satanic Temple, which is an organization that advocates for benevolence and empathy, opposes tyrannical authority, and encourages practical common sense thinking. So right off, you can tell why Christians hate them, right? No, but that's why they do these things. They do these things to illustrate important arguments about freedom of religion and freedom of speech, right? That's what they're about. It has nothing to do with a red skin pitchfork feller running around trading souls for fiddle lessons and 
like it ain't about that. So you might ask, well, why use Satan at all? Because it works, right? If the organization was called the same person's club for making sense and doing good, nobody would have ever heard of it, but they understand that Christians can never resist a moral panic, especially one of the satanic variety. And as a result, nearly every American is aware of their cause, right? The Satan stuff works. And of course, that, that isn't the end of the story there in Iowa, is it? I saw another Satanist in Iowa recently uh, pushing back on the after school programs, the religious after school programs, saying they were going to start one up for, you know, um, the satanic children or whatnot. We had that in Tennessee, too, in Memphis. That was part of what right. uh, encouraged that video and the, the thing at the, the state house and whatnot. But I don't know. Well, somebody, somebody vandalized it. Oh, yeah. And, and then since then, a legislator is introducing a bill that you cannot put up anything satanic in a government facility where they have a government forum, and of course, which is patently unconstitutional. But Yeah, right. Right. Well, so right. it's not all fun and games with you, Trey. And when we come back, we want to talk about another one of your interests, universal basic income. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Doug Hinahara, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. I consider myself fortunate in that I wasn't raised in an overly religious family, so I was allowed to think for myself. And around the time I was 17, as I was exploring these ideas of religion, I was told by a fundamentalist Christian that my grandmother, who had emigrated from Japan, was destined to eternal damnation because she was a Buddhist. And I couldn't accept that, and it kind of unraveled from there for me. So at this point in my life, I've been, become very comfortable with the idea that I don't need religion uh, or belief in God to be a moral person and live an ethical life. I'm proud of the fact that I have two daughters who have grown up to be wonderful young women, and I'm proud to say also atheist. Free Thought Matters is back. Matt Kenyon, who is FFRF's Director of First Impressions, and I are interviewing liberal redneck comedian Trey Crowder. So can you tell us briefly about a documentary about universal basic income and how you got involved? Steve and Rennie, the writer and director and also produ and then the producer of the of the documentary just like had the idea for it and I think got a hold of me somehow. We went out to dinner and they were talking about how, you know, they thought UBI was going to be super important in the coming years and all that. And I, at that point, I had heard of it, but didn't know that much about it. And I told him I agreed. At that point in time, I was thinking like, well, you know, with automation and AI and stuff, and I'm not saying I don't think this now, I was like, eventually, you're either going to have to have a UBI or everything's going to completely fall apart. There's not going to be enough jobs for all the people eventually. I mean, I would have thought it would that landscape would look even worse by 2024 than it does. So, you know, I don't know. I'm no expert. I'm no uh, tech prognosticator. But either way, I was open to the idea of UBI also because of my background where I came from and everything. So I told him, yeah, sure, I'll, you know, help out. And the idea at first was just that, like, they had heard me talk about my hometown and what had happened there. And I, I referenced it very briefly in passing earlier. But uh, it's just been completely economically devastated by the, the factory leaving in the mid-90s, and it's never recovered, and it's been horrifically bad for 20-something straight years. They'd heard me talk about that on various platforms, and they wanted to, like, go there and, you know, use Salina, that's my hometown, as a backdrop for this story. And I was like, that's, that was the, that's all they asked me to do at first. I was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And it was just going to be a tiny piece of the documentary they were planning on making. 
they went to Salina, got so, uh, you know, wrapped up and everything that was going on there. It became a much larger part of the documentary, which is what happens with documentaries a lot of the time, which meant, you know, my involvement expanded. And eventually I became like a producer of it, too. I am a producer of that documentary, but I always, you know, uh, deflect the, the credit because I was it was not, you know, I just came on board because I believed in it, but it was their brainchild, you know, and they were uh, really the masterminds behind it. But we, um, yeah, I still do believe that UBI is a, you know, a good idea and could be a great force for good, but it doesn't seem like, you know, Andrew Yang, we interviewed Andrew Yang. He was kind of the, the, he was at the tip of the spear for that at the, at the time. He's sort of gone in interesting direction in the intervening years. And, you know, Bernie Sanders would talk about it, but also Bernie's, you know, time seems to have sort of passed or is passing. And it's like, I don't know what's going to happen with UBI going forward, but I don't think it's going to just go away. I think it's going to, you know, remain an issue because I still believe at some point, you know, we're going to reach a point where it has to be discussed. Something's going to have to give and be figured out. Uh, I think, eventually. Well, so. we, we surveyed the members of the Freedom from Religion Foundation four years ago, and it surprised me, a majority supported universal basic income. So, to lighten up, let's do a lightning round. And here goes. Can you tell me what you think about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey? Well, I'm unfortunately, I'm a Raiders fan because the Titans weren't into it. I like the Titans too, but I'm a Raiders fan, which means I've hated the Chiefs for 20-something years, <laughs> and I really hate them now. Uh, I love Taylor Swift, though. I've long time been a Taylor Swift fan, so I have conflicting opinions on it. Uh, let's put it that way. I don't think it's a government psyop. I can tell you that much. <laughs> yes, yes. How about uh, country music? Well, it depends on what you mean. I mean, people in California ask me all the time, you like country music? And I'm always like, yes, but probably not what you're imagining when you think of country music. Because they think, people out here think country music is what is coming out of Nashville, what's played on the radio. I don't even know who the current day artists are. My references for terrible country are still like Florida Georgia Line and Jason Aldean and stuff like that. And I hate that stuff. But like good country music, which does still exist, you know, like Tyler Childers and Sturgill Simpson and people like that, I'm a huge, huge fan of. Some of my favorite music, period. How about Grits? Grits, uh, I like them if you got, you know, I'm, I was also a fat kid growing up. And so like, yeah, if they got butter and cheese in them, those types of grits, I'll, I'll house them. But, you know, go to New Orleans, throw some shrimp in the mix. Why not? Big fan. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you got to really fatten them up. For me to really throw down on some grits <laughs> and uh, fried food. Oh God! Oh, you heard what I just said. I mean, if I could love fried food, and there have been so many points in my life where I was like, I really need to eat something that isn't beige. I'm eating way <laughs> too much beige food lately. But I just, I'm just, you know, such a fan. Yeah. Beer. Beer? Uh, I, as I've gotten older, I, you know, of course, I, I used to drink a whole lot of beer as a burgeoning redneck, plenty of natty light, natty ice, things are just the most terrible swill you can imagine, but get you lit, though. But I, uh, as I've gotten older, it it just kind of bloats me, too. I still like, like, a good beer, but, you know, um, I'm more of like a... If I, like if I'm drink, I don't drink near as much anymore. But if I'm gonna drink, it's something like a vodka soda or something. You know, <laughs> one or two of those because I just can't. I can't go at it like I used to. Just don't have the con constituency for or whatever the word is. Constitution. Uh, for Constitution. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Constitution for it anymore. Yeah. Uh, book bands. Oh, I hate book bands. I think it's like hugely detrimental. I've been thinking about that. My son's. I've been thinking about that a lot because I heard that like a lot of kids in this country currently, and it's sort of a separate issue, but equally troubling. A lot of kids in this country can't read or like are really, you know, really deficient readers. And it's like an epidemic that a lot of people don't know about. And I, my sons, thankfully, are like voracious readers and very good readers and good students and all that. And I've been thinking lately about how like so they're 11 and 12. But anyway, I'm about to start like seeking out these banned books because we live in California and like making them read them or, or like suggesting that they read them because that's how I feel about it. I mean, my growing up where I did, I read so many books and like they were my entree into like, even having read those books when I left Salina, there was still so much I didn't know about the outside world, but it would have been infinitely worse if I hadn't read, you know, the books that I had read. I think it's hugely important. Trans bands. 
uh, it's completely ridiculous. I don't know where, I don't know how they justify acting like it's any of their business. That's the thing is too. It's like a small town culture. It's ostensibly supposed to be, you know, you mind your own business. Don't stick it. But of course they break that all the time. They say that, but then they gossip about each other behind everybody's back and peek through their blinds and stuff. So I guess it does kind of make sense, but like, yeah, it's just, what does it have to do with you is my whole thing. And then they, you know, they'll, their response to that is like, well, you know, they're grooming children and stuff, and we care about the children. Somebody's got to think about the children, which, of course, is not true. And on top of that, you know, far more religious authority figures uh, are, you know, predatory towards children than trans people ever have. And, of course, none of that matters. So I just don't – I don't know what kind of, you know, actual basis you can you can have for – for supporting that position other than just like admitting like we think it's weird and we're grossed out by it, you know, which they're not going to do. So speaker of the like house, it. Mike Johnson, MAGA Mike, he was like, uh, you know, when he first popped up, nobody really heard of him and he looks like a pretty straight laced guy. So it's like, I think people assume maybe they're like, oh, okay, but at least they found one of the less, lunaticy ones to plug in there right but then you like spend any amount of time looking into the dude you find out that he's you know just as just as uh insane and regressive as any of the rest of them are and he's doing all the same stuff you know i mean he's there's really no dissent on the republican side anymore in my opinion the people that attempt it like adam kinzinger and liz cheney and people like that they you know they get ousted so He's just like the rest of them. So how can folks find out more about where to catch your stand-up comedy? Yeah, you just go to uh, TreyCrowder.com. It's T-R-A-E Crowder. That is the white trash spelling, TreyCrowder.com. Uh, and see all my upcoming tour dates and come see me if I'm going to be near you. Also, just whatever social platform you use, if you do, you can follow me out on that platform just at Trey Crowder. Just look up well, T-R-A-E Crowder. Thank you so much, Trey Crowder, for um, making us laugh and joining us today. Oh, no, it was, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.